<clears throat> this morning we are looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And uh, feel free to turn your Bibles to that uh, particular book and chapter or, of course, follow along on the screen. We're going to be looking at a very familiar passage where Paul talks about a foundation being laid and how those of us who have that foundation are building on it and how we need to be careful what we build because a day is coming in which what we build is going to be examined. Now, what I'd like to um, do is begin reading in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 3, and I'll read through verse 15. <clears throat> Paul writes this, <clears throat> And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you are not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now, you are not yet able, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? And are you not walking like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not mere men? What then is Apollos, and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God which was given to me like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it, but each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Now again, I believe Paul has in mind here a couple of different things. He certainly is referring to his own work and Apollos' work and uh, the work that the Lord is doing and what kind of a building is being built made up of true believers and false. But I believe what he is saying here also applies to everyone in whose life that foundation is laid because everybody who is saved is also uh, building and building with various types of things. And as we're reminded here in Scripture, a day of reckoning is coming when what we have built will be tested. And as it's tested, if there's something that remains through this testing, we will receive a reward. What we're looking at this morning is the fact that the Bible teaches that there are rewards, that each one is going to be rewarded according to what he has done. And I want that to be our motivation, something to help move us to do what we do with, with greater zeal, knowing that uh, the Lord is not so unjust as to forget our labor of love, the work that we have done for His glory. Uh, we all need motivation. So prayerfully, God will give that to us this morning. Now again, uh, we are looking, as, as we've seen in the past, a series on what it means to know the Lord Jesus Christ, and certainly this is an aspect of it. We've seen that one aspect of knowing Him certainly is knowing about Him, but we've also seen it's more. And it's more than just simply knowing Him in a personal relationship. It is having Christ formed in us. It is becoming more like Him so that we begin to have His heart and share His desire, what it is He wants. We begin to think His thoughts, and in doing so, we begin to do His works. We've seen that knowing Christ means to do what we do, first and foremost, because we love God. We love the Father more than anything else. We love His Son, Jesus Christ, and because we love our neighbor as we love ourselves. 
It means wanting the things that God has promised us so much that we're willing to deny ourselves of what we might otherwise have gained for ourselves in this world by living for ourselves and to use our lives to gain what we might for Him, no matter what the cost, including what others might think of us. Remember Jesus Christ, because the joy set before Him endured the cross. He laid down His life. He didn't seek after His own things, but the things of His Father. And He didn't care how much reproach, how much hatred, how much shame that He had to endure. He thought nothing of it because of the glory of that reward. Well, the Lord says if we know Him, that's also what we will experience. Now, last week we also saw that knowing Jesus means you will enjoy doing what Jesus enjoyed doing. Again, having His desires within you, not the least of which is serving. Jesus said the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. We saw that what we do, we always do at all times what we want to do, and we do what's going to bring us the greatest amount of pleasure. Well, Jesus was exactly the same way. He did what pleased Him the most and what was going to bring Him the greatest amount of pleasure, and that was in serving His Father and in serving you. Jesus came to lay down His life for you, and He was rewarded for doing so. Because He humbled Himself and became the least of all, He was also exalted to become uh, the greatest of all. Jesus says, if you follow His example, if you will humble yourself and serve others, you also will be exalted. And to the degree that you humble yourself and serve, to that degree, you will be exalted. Well, here's one indication that there is a reward ahead of us based upon what we do. Now, understanding that what you do with your life, now remember your life goes on after this life, this is only the first part of it, but understanding that this least part of your life, this shortest part of your life here on earth is going to determine how happy you are going to be forever. You should do what you can, your best, your very best here to make sure that it will be the best there. This should be the motivation that is before you in everything that you do. As Jonathan Edwards once said, it doesn't matter who prospers below. What matters is who prospers in the eternal state because that amount of time that is much greater than this very, very brief time that we're spending here in this world. So this morning, I want us to consider two things. The first thing is that the Bible does, in fact, teach that there are greater and lesser rewards in heaven. But secondly, that this should give you then the motivation that you need to serve Him as much as you can during this time because all your rewards are based upon what you do with your life here on earth. So first of all, let's consider the Bible does teach that there are greater rewards and there are lesser rewards in heaven. <coughs> That is, as a matter of fact, what Paul teaches us in our passage. Notice, first of all, he says that by God's grace, he laid a foundation in the lives of the Corinthians. And of course, that foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul went to Corinth and he preached the gospel. And there were those who believed by God's grace and they turned from their sins and they trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. The foundation was laid a new foundation for their lives. They became new creatures and began going the right direction. Now, the same thing is true of you if you have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as well. If you have turned from your sins and trusted Him because you've heard the gospel, you are a new creation. You have a new heart. You have a new purpose. You have a new foundation laid for your life. Now, secondly, since that foundation was laid, the Corinthians, Paul says, and you have been building on it. That is, since you've been saved, you've been doing different things with your life. Now, some of these things have value. Those are the things you do for the Lord. 
Those are the things you do that are according to His will. I mean, what it is He wants you to do. Those are the things that you do out of love for Him because you, you, you love the Lord, not just for what He's done for you, but you really do love Him. You love who He is. And they are the things that you do because you want to honor Him. You want to give Him glory. Now, Paul says in, in his representation that these are the things that are represented by the gold and the silver and the precious stones. But some of the things that you do with your life are also worthless. Those are the things you do for yourself. Now, these are not the things, I don't think Paul has in mind here the things that are necessarily sinful, because I do believe that, well, that, well Paul tells us and Jude tells us and we're told throughout Scripture that when the Lord saves you, He does wipe the slate clean as far as your guilt and sin and He will present you before Himself on that day blameless. None of your guilt will cling to you. But that still doesn't mean that you don't do things that they may not necessarily be sinful, but they don't have any value. They are worthless. Those are the things that you do that are purely for yourself, for your own pleasure with yourself only in mind and not with God's glory in mind, or the things that you maybe do for Him, the things that He actually commands, but when you're doing them, you're not really doing them out of love for Him, but for yourself. And you're not doing them for His glory and honor, but rather for your own so that people will see you and applaud you, kind of like the Pharisees, you know, who would uh, sound the trumpet on the corner before they would lift up public prayer and everybody would see them and they'd applaud them. and. Even though they did what God commanded, at least with regard to the prayer, they didn't receive a reward because they were doing it to be seen of men. Well, that's worthless. That's, that's really hypocrisy in, in their case. But we can do that kind of thing too. And those are the things that I believe Paul is representing by the wood, hay, and straw. Now, finally, Paul says, <clears throat> one day what you have built is going to be examined. On the day of judgment, Jesus is going to go through your building and He's going to see what it is you've done with your life. And He is going to put His fire to it, as it were, to see what's going to burn and what isn't going to burn. Well, everything that is worthless is going to be burned up, it's going to go up in smoke. But everything that has value will not burn. And that is what He is going to reward. Now, what if everything you've built is destroyed? What if it all burns up? Well, thankfully, the foundation is still there. Paul says you will still be saved by the free grace of God, not by anything you've done, but by, by the grace of Christ alone. Remember, salvation is by grace through faith alone, not by your works. The works are only with regard to rewards. Well, you'll be saved, but you won't have a reward. Now, Paul teaches us here that there are rewards. Every believer is not going to get the same thing in heaven. Some are going to have greater reward because they've done more for the Lord. Some are going to have a lesser reward because they've done less. And some will have no reward. And why is that? Well, because they could not overcome their sins enough. They couldn't overcome the lure of the world enough in order to actually get down to doing what it is that the Lord called them to do for the right reasons. In other words, they never actually got down to serving the Lord. They were just serving themselves their whole life. That can happen. Paul's telling us that can happen. But that's not the state you want to be in. That's not the state I want to be in. Now, I do realize that there are some places in Scripture that do seem to teach that we're all going to get the same thing. As a matter of fact, years ago when I first came here and I was convinced that this is what the Bible taught and I was teaching it in Sunday school class, somebody raised the objection, what about the parable of the vineyard? Remember in the parable of the vineyard, uh, the owner of the vineyard goes out early in the morning, he finds workers, he says, you know, he agrees with them for a denarius for a day's work and he sends them into the vineyard. And then he goes out at different hours of the day, almost all the way up to, to ending time, and he hires these other workers. 
Well, when, when the day is over and all the workers gather together, he gives to the, each one of them exactly what he promised. And the ones who started later got the same thing as the ones who started earlier. They all got the same thing, regardless of when they began to work. Now, some professing Christians use this as an excuse not to work. I mean, why work when we're all going to get the same thing, right? I mean, why put yourself out? But I want you to see a couple things. First of all, Paul is teaching us here that it is otherwise. There are rewards. Jesus already taught us the same thing when He told His disciples, and this is in Matthew 20, verses 26 through 27. We looked at it last week. Whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Now, greater means that there are lesser. And first means that there's second, third, fourth, and last. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And again, you have the idea of great and least, or greater and, well, yeah, get the idea. He tells us in the parable of the talents and in the parable of the minas that those who do more are going to receive a greater reward, and those who do less will have less, and those who do nothing. Now, in that case, they didn't know the Lord at all. They actually get swept off into outer darkness. Jesus already told us that there's two places of honor, one at His right hand and one at His left, and it is reserved for the two greatest servants in the kingdom of heaven. Now, the parable of the vineyard is not meant to teach you there's no rewards in heaven. It's only meant to tell you that it doesn't matter when you come to Christ in faith, you are still going to enter into God's rest, whether it be at the beginning of your life or at the end of your life. It wasn't meant to teach us that everyone receives the same reward. Otherwise, the Bible contradicts itself. The Lord wants you to know that you are going to be rewarded for what you do. He intends to reward you for everything you do for Him in this world. And the more you do, the greater will be your reward. Now, the second thing I want us to see is that since this is true, it should motivate you. <clears throat> to serve Him as best you can to get as much reward as you can. I mean, why does God hold out the promise of reward in the first place? What is His purpose behind giving it to you? It's because He wants to motivate you to do the right thing. As a matter of fact, He wants to motivate you to do what needs to be done in His kingdom. Now, He wants to motivate you for your well-being because it will be better for you if you obey than if you don't obey. He wants to motivate you for the well-being of your neighbor because you are the ones that, that have the gospel and you are the workers, and if, if you don't get motivated and, and reach out to the lost, then they're going to perish. So He wants to motivate you ultimately for the advancement of His kingdom. The Lord knows that we need motivation. That's why He holds it out to us. And I know we don't like to think of it in these terms, but we do need to realize that even Jesus, as a man, needed motivation. Uh, that's one of the reasons why the Father set the reward in front of Him and the joy that would be His if He would simply uh, submit to what it is the Father wanted Him to do. And we know that because of that joy that was set before Him, the author to the Hebrews says, He endured the cross, despised the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Well, the Father has also set a reward in front of you as well to motivate you, and He tells you that to the degree that you do humble yourself and serve Him in this world, to that degree you will be rewarded. Now, one thing I thought that might help us in, along these lines is to consider for a moment what kind of reward we're talking about, because if it's not something that you want, it's not going to motivate you. Well, let me just say this morning to begin with, if you are a Christian, it will be something that you want. Now, what is the reward? Well, for one thing, it's glory and honor, glory and honor, recognition. 
Now, if there is one thing that all men crave, and women, and even children, whether we be converted or not converted, it is glory. Now, what is glory? Well, glory is recognition. Glory is being honored for doing something special. I think we all want to do something great, don't we? We all want to have our moment of glory in this world, and I think some of us want more than a moment. We'd like, you know, we'd like it to last a little bit longer than that. We want others to look at us, to recognize us, and to see how special we are. That's just, again, the way, way that we are. I mean, remember the last awards ceremony that you were a part of, or the last athletic competition, or maybe the last time you applied for a job, or maybe a scholarship to college, or maybe you entered something in the county fair. I think when you did those things, you were hoping that you might be singled out, that you might win the awards, that you might win the competition, that you might get the job, that you might get the scholarship or win the blue ribbon for what it is you entered into, you know, into the fair. I don't think you were all hoping for last place and to just be, you know, just sort of effaced and, and, and forgotten. Well, all of these things are simply different kinds of honor. And you see, that's what God promises to give you is honor if you will serve Him faithfully. Now, it's not just any kind of honor, but it's honor that comes from Him. Now, Jesus says that those who know Him will actually put more value on that kind of honor than they will the honor that comes from this world. Listen to what Jesus says in John 5, verse 44. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? I mean, you must not believe, you must not really believe what God says is true if you're still seeking the glories of this world when the Father has promised to give you glory and you know that His glory is going to be better. Well, you see, this is what He promised Jesus, wasn't it? And this is what Jesus sought because He saw its value. And this is what moved Him to humble Himself, to serve. And because of this, Jesus received the greatest honor that could be bestowed. Now, God says to you, if you humble yourself and you will obey Him and serve Him, He also will honor you, and to the degree that you do, to that degree He will honor you. Now, let's not forget at the same time that this kind of glory, this kind of honor which God promises you is the kind of glory that you actually get to keep. This is something that you have forever. Now, the world does have a glory, it does have an honor, and there are people who are honored by it. But how long does that glory last? How long does that honor last? Well, it lasts as long as you're in the public eye. Some people fade while they're still living, others fade when they die, but it doesn't last forever. It's only temporary. When you die, at least, you'll have to leave it behind. But the honor that God gives you is an honor that you will have forever. So the first thing the Lord promises to give you is glory. He promises to give you honor. But what else can you expect to have from Him in heaven? Well, besides seeing God in all of His glory and all of His beauty and seeing the Lord Jesus Christ seated at His right hand, which is the greatest blessing anyone can have. We all like to look at beautiful things, right? Well, this is the most beautiful sight we can ever behold. We get to see that. And besides the blessing of being with glorified saints and angels in heaven and sharing that love, that perfect love which, the God, which God has given to us, uh, we get to have a kind of love that is purified, that is perfect, and that is motivated perfectly by the Holy Spirit. We get to experience something in its fullness that we've only had a taste of here, and that is all the love that God has to give us. Now, you know, love is one of the greatest things I think we would all admit that, that we're ever going to experience in this life. Love from our families, love from our friends, love from the body of Christ. But the greatest love that we have ever experienced for Christians is the love that God actually has for us 
the love that He has for you. That is the most fulfilling, the most rewarding and satisfying experience that you will ever have in this world. But you realize that here you only have had a taste of that love, only a smattering. Uh, Paul calls it a down payment. And yet it was the only thing that was needed for you to, to taste, as it were, f to turn your life around, to, to keep you from going the direction of the world and now to begin pursuing Him. Now, if that taste was, was powerful enough and good enough to, to change the whole direction of your life, just think about how good the whole inheritance is going to be. Now, the Lord says that that is what you will experience in heaven. Some believe that the more you serve the Lord, the more you give up and humble yourself and serve Him here, the more you're going to have the capacity to experience that love, the, the greater you're going to experience it, although all of us will experience it to the full. Now, does the thought of that much love and the thought of the honors that God has promised of being with Him and with His Son and with the saints and the angels, does that affect you? Does that motivate you to seek the Lord more or to do the very best you can to give Him honor and glory during this very short time that you have here on earth so that God might give you more of those things for the rest of eternity? You realize that your entire life here is less than a moment in, in the totality of your life. It goes on endlessly. You know, we're talking about, well, the Scripture says 70 years of due to strength, 80 years. Some make it 90, and, and a very few make it over 100, right? But what is 100 years compared to a million, a billion, a trillion, or a trillion times a trillion, or continue multiplying and have 10 to whatever number and you just keep multiplying zeros, time goes on endlessly. What is a hundred years compared to that? So how are you going to use your time, you see? Which is more important? Is it valuable enough to you to motivate you? Now, if these things don't move you, if they don't motivate you, <clears throat> maybe it's because you've never really even had the first taste of what it is that God has to give. Maybe you've never seen the Lord Jesus Christ through the eyes of faith and seeing His glory, you realize that only the Lord can show it to you by His Holy Spirit. Only He can give you that taste. Well, if these things don't motivate you, I would strongly encourage you to ask God to give you that taste, to ask the Lord to open your eyes because He alone can do it. If He doesn't do it, consider What's going to happen? Consider what the Apostle Paul already told us, that if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are using this brief time on earth to store up wrath for yourself in the day of His wrath. You need to see, you need to taste so that you will go the right direction. Well, only the Lord can do that. And if the Lord is willing to do that for you, it will change your life. It will be changed immediately. It will be changed permanently. You will not be the same person you were. You will not keep going the same direction that you went before. You will be a new creation, and you will begin to seek the Lord and the things that God has for you in heaven. Now, maybe you have seen them, but maybe you haven't seen them as clearly as you need to see them. Maybe you haven't seen them as powerfully as you should see them, and maybe that's why they're not providing the motivation they should provide for you. Now, if that is the case with you, you're not going to find the motivation you need to seek God's kingdom as you should seek it until you actually do see it as you should see it or right? the way you need to see it. If that's the case with you, you need more of God's Holy Spirit because He is the one who opens your eyes. He's the one who gives clarity. He is the one who gives conviction. He is the one who gives desire and makes the taste of these things. I mean, He is the taste of heaven, that, that bit or that smattering of that love which God has for us, which we inherit fully in heaven. He is it. And the more you have of Him, the more you will experience that. And again, I would remind you there's only two ways that you can get Him. 
or more of His influence. The means of grace, okay? Use the means of grace. Spend time with the Lord. And the other is, of course, you need to stop doing something. You need to stop seeking the world and stop doing the things that you know weaken His influence in your life. Now, let me just close by saying this. Jesus saw the reward. He saw it clearly. He saw it powerfully. He was filled with the Spirit of God above measure. He lived with the reality of that joy always in front of Him. And of course, He did what He needed to in order to receive that joy. Now, if you know Jesus Christ, that is what is in your heart. That is what your heart is moving you to do. You realize that your time in this world is short. You know that eternity is determined by how you use it. Again, not just trusting in the Lord, that's important, but having trusted how you live, your reward is going to be based on that. And you understand that because your time in this world is very short, that it also makes it very precious. And so I exhort you and encourage you and myself this morning, make sure that you are using your time your talents, your opportunity, your resources, as best as you possibly can. Make sure that you're doing everything you do, even in your recreations. Make sure you are doing those things with a godly purpose behind them. Make sure it's according to the will of God. Make sure it is out of love for Him. Make sure it is for His glory, even when you do things that are we call recreational. Do all that you do for the glory of God, and you will be storing up treasures in heaven. You will receive greater glory, greater honor, and perhaps even a greater capacity to enjoy that love which the Lord has for you in heaven. These things are worth it. If you are a believer, if you've seen the glory of God, if you've tasted of the Holy Spirit, you know that they are worth it. And so, do what you know is most important and seek to gather up as much of that treasure as you possibly can while you were here in this world. May the Lord give each of us the grace to do that. Let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask Him for the help that we need.